we're at the end of the sermon series. The sermon series, as you may recall, started with the notion that we were to fix our eyes on Jesus, as the writer to Hebrews tells us. But what does it mean to fix our eyes on Jesus? And so far we've looked at three issues. The first one is that when we are lost, we need to have someone who guides us, and it's Jesus who will do that. So the first lesson is that we must be first in our lostness. The second one is that we can be lonely. All of us have experienced loneliness. Many people refer to loneliness as a foretaste of death. And so when we take a look at this issue of being lonely, and what does Christ do about it? We look at Christ is first in our loneliness as an answer to our loneliness. Third, we look at the whole issue of what it is that we can do whole issue of employment, the whole issue of work, and we decided that Christ must be first in our labor in order for us to counter and answer the fear of being fruitless and not having a meaningful life. Today we're going to start off with the whole notion of Christ must be first in our future. And what does it mean for Christ to be first in our future? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we sometimes get lost, we sometimes are lonely, we sometimes feel that our life has no meaning. Help us to recognize that when you enter our lives, and when we invite you into our life, that you will be there for us in a way that will never create any doubt in our lives. Does that mean that we don't have any doubts? No, Lord. You know that how often we doubt you. But we also want you to know, and I'm sure you do, that you love us and care for us, even in the midst of our doubts about our future. In your name we pray. Amen. Many people have the desire to know more about the future. There's a wonderful book called The Experts Speak. And it's a book about all the predictions that various people have made about the future. And in the subtitle, it says the definitive compendium of authoritative misinformation. And this book is filled with predictions, and I've just chosen a few of them for us to look at briefly in order to get a hold of the topic that we're talking about today. And for example, the book has various predictions about computers. Let me give you some examples. Computers in the future may weigh no more than 1.5 tons. Popular mechanics forecasting the relentless march of science. Labs, uh, computers no longer qualify. Thomas Watson, who was the chairman of IBM in 1943, said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. We decided not to have any computers. There's no reason anyone would want a computer in their home according to the president of Digital Equipment Corporation. And then we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. Decca recorded rejecting the Beatles in 1962. The book goes on and on and talks about the predictions that people have made. My, one of my favorites is General Sedgwick at the Battle of Spotsylvania in Pennsylvania during the Civil War. And in that battle, General Sedgwick was known as an expert on the trajectory of cannonballs when they were, when they were shot at the front lines. On one occasion during that battle, one of the men who was with General Sedgwick came up to him and said, General, don't you think that we're getting a little bit too close? Shouldn't we fall back? And the last words of General Sedgwick were, they couldn't hit an elephant at this nest. He wasn't even able to complete the sentence distance. And so we can go on and on and give examples of why it is that we cannot trust the predictions that are made, not only in our own individual lives, but in the lives of the nation and the world. Why do, you then, why do we then go out and try to seek predictions? Why is it that there are people who go to media, even the Bible, not to, who go to various witchcrafts in order to find
find out about the future. Why is it that people read the horoscopes? I don't have, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand whether you do or do not, but you know if you read the horoscope. Perhaps with a jaundiced eye thinking that that doesn't really apply, but it couldn't hurt for me to check to see what God is going to do in my life and what people are going to do. You see, I think the reason we have such a penchant and a desire for information about the future is because we are afraid. We are afraid about the future. We are afraid about being uncertain. We want to have things locked up. And so we have a tendency to go to people to give us an answer in order for us to live with more certainty and with less fear. Now the Bible recognizes that we have fear. The Bible without question states again and again, in fact, 365 times in one way or another, the Bible tells us, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. It recognizes that you and I are in living in situations where we are going to be afraid. But it also tells us that the only way that we can actually deal with our, with our fear is to put this, those fears into the hands of Christ. 365 times. One for every day of the week, or day of the year. Do not be afraid. And yet we are. We are afraid that we will miss out on something. We are afraid that our insurance plan won't last all the way. We're afraid of some kind of inflation that will eat away at our nest egg that we so diligently saved up for. Why is that? Because you are afraid. I'd like you just for a moment think about what it is that gives you the greatest fear. Close your eyes. Think about it. What gives you the greatest fear? Tonight, when you go to bed, think about that fear again. But this time, don't go to sleep with a sleeping pill. Don't go to bed with a TV on. But turn your fear over to God. Now you see, when we are trying to live our life under our own control, we have a reason to be afraid. Because we are not competent to deal with our lives. We may like to show our children that we are, or show our parents that we are, but the reality is that only God can handle our fears and those circumstances which create our fears. Now when we look at that issue more closely, let's divide it into two different types of future. The, the Bible talks about a future which is an earthly future. And the earthly future is not juxtaposed, but it's right, right as long side of the eternal future. But I mean, what do I mean by a, a, an earthly future? An earthly future focuses on what is happening in our lives today. And there are four broad categories which actually represent the span or the spectrum of what the future is in the earth. There are four areas. Education is the first. We all have to have some kind of education. If we don't educate ourselves or one another or our children, somebody else will do so. Education is the first broad area where we ask Christ to come into our lives in order for us to learn more. You can talk about maturation, which is another way of talking about education. Edification. We the teachers who are here in our congregation, in our midst, know what it's like and the influence that you have on children when you are the educator, when you are the teacher. The second area is vocation. Somehow or another we need to grapple with the notion that we cannot ourselves determine what we're going to do in our lives. We have a tendency to sort of say, well, let me take a look at my skills. And then we sort of write down our skills. Let me look at my hopes. Let me look at my desires. And then we say, now, I think I'm going to be good at doing this. Or perhaps there's never been a question. The 
farm is passed down from one son to another son, although well, that's changing dramatically in our society. So the second area is vocation. The third area is location. Where are you going to be called? God calls you to a specific place. Have you ever noticed in scripture that God calls you to a specific place and calls you to a specific person? And then generally speaking, he does so through other individuals rather than through a whole group of people. So we have education, we have vocation, we have location, and then today, we're using the modern term, we have cohabitation. Now, we used to talk about it as marriage, but we can't talk about it that way alone anymore because so many people cohabit with one another before they ever get married. And so we can talk about cohabitation. But God plays a role in each one of these areas. He wants to be there for you as you decide upon the education that you're going to have. He wants to be there for you when you're talking about vocation, the location, and the cohabitation. He wants to be there with you. Because he knows that as much, even though we try, we are really not capable. We are not capable of managing our own lives. And we need him. We need him in order to have a meaningful life. Let me give you a, a passage or refer you to a passage in... <clears throat> Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, it's one of the most wonderful passages that's most often quoted about the grace of God, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. May I read that again? We are his workmanship for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. God does not leave us alone. He does not leave us stranded. He doesn't send us out without giving us the gifts that we need. No, not at all. He is there for us, and he wants us to have and the purpose is to do the work that he has beforehand set for us. And we have a tendency to do it the other way around. We're going to live our lives the way we want to live our lives. And then at the end, or towards the end of our lives, we say, well, now that I have some free time, what does God want me to do? God wants to be part of your life. And he wants to give us a purpose because he knows that without a purpose, we have no future. And that purpose rests only in our Savior, Lord and Savior. <coughs> or put it in another way, in the 28th chapter of Matthew, the last few verses in the 28th chapter, God puts it in another way. We have a tendency to think that it only refers to ministers, and it does refer to them to us. But let me read you. Go therefore. You know the passage. But let's read it again to see if there's something fresh that pops out of it in order to grabs us and leads us to recognize that every person here has been anointed by God for what purpose? To do the works that he set for us to do. Or as it is put in the Great Commission, now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. It's okay if you doubt. It's okay if you doubt, as long as you take your doubts to our Lord and Savior. It's okay to doubt, as long as you take your doubts to our Lord and Savior. He goes on to say, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore... Okay. Remember we talked one time about get ready, get set. We are really great people in the church. Do we get ready, we get set, and we forget the third step, which is to go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What a great commission. 
That's not just for pastors. That's not just for church workers. That's for you and for me to be given a great commission. Now, that goes so far as to, so far we've talked about the earthly future. The earthly future which has a purpose for each one of us. And a purpose that has been given to us by God himself and Christ himself. But there's also a heavenly future. That heavenly future is best summarized in the 14th chapter of John. It's a passage that often has been referenced by people at funerals because they were likely to preach on that passage, which I'm glad to do. And in that passage in the 14th chapter of John, Jesus talks to the disciples. And he says something there that ought to give us both a halt, stop us in our tracks, and it also ought to comfort us, challenge us and comfort us. But what does he say? He says, let not your hearts be troubled. How many of you have had troubled hearts at one time or another in your life? How many of you have troubled hearts right now? Things aren't going as well in your family as you would like. How many of you have difficulties because God doesn't seem to be there for you? Have you ever felt like, gee, God seems to be working in the lives of all the other people, but we must be second-class saints because he isn't doing anything in our lives? Yes, we have. Many of us have that fear. But there are no second-class saints in the kingdom of God. Not one. You and I may feel that way, but when we feel that way, we ought to turn to Scripture, we ought to turn here and read what it says, let not your hearts be troubled. Why? Because we are to believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And then he goes on to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. How many of us have followed heroes? How many of us have desired to be recognized as heroes? How many of us have settled for a life that doesn't really enrich us or enrich the people around us because we are so afraid? But God tells us, don't be afraid. Why? Because he has gone and prepared a way and we can trust him because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore we can put our trust in him and know that each one of us here, each one of us who believes in our Lord and Savior has a room prepared for him. Mine's going to have a lot of books in it. It's probably going to be useless. Because, well, I'm not going to say anything. See, it's important. Important for us to know that our earthly future and our heavenly future are in Christ's hands. Our earthly future Not in you. Even though you have strong hands, I'm looking at Dan, has great strong hands. And there's Jim Crable out there in the back. I feel like he's shaking his hand. I mean, he has the biggest hands that I have ever seen. I mean, my hands sort of dissolve in him. But even his hands aren't big enough to carry the burdens that we have in our lives, to give us a future that only God can give us, that will prepare a place for, we will prepare a place for earthly future and our heavenly future. In 1960, a long time ago for some of us, 1960, when President Kennedy was running for presidency, not yet elected, he would often end his speeches with a story about Colonel Davenport, a colonel in the Connecticut Army, and in 1789 he was the speaker of the House of Connecticut. House of Representatives in Connecticut. And on one occasion, during 1789, the members of the Congress there looked outside and it was ominous because there was an incredible large black cloud that was coming towards them. It was engulfing the city room that they were meeting in. And many of the representatives there got up and they wanted to leave because they were afraid that the judgment day was coming. And Colonel Davenport stood up. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, he probably just said gentlemen, because they were in those days, they didn't have ladies. He 
said, Kelly, said, if the judgment day isn't here yet, then we have nothing to worry about. If, on the other hand, the judgment day is here, then I want the judger to see me carrying out my duties in spite of what's going on, rather than hiding someplace out of fear. You may have fears. You may have the desire for more certainty in your life. But the only person who can give that to us, that can assure us, is Christ himself. And he will do so. And if he does, he'll probably come looking at you, seeing if you're being faithful in the work that God has set for you.